Welcome, everyone, to one of the last talks in the Back to Basics track. As I like to say in front of all these talks, uh, thank you for coming to the Back to Basics track this year. I uh, hope not to see you in the Back to Basics track next year. Um, you get to go to other things. Or welcome back, right. Um, so again, uh, please remember to provide feedback on the website, uh, rate the talks, give us feedback for next year. All right. So my name is Arthur O'Dwyer, and I'm here to talk to you about a slightly less basic topic today, uh, type erasure. How many of you, by the way, were in my generic lambdas, uh, or lambdas from scratch talk uh, just uh, before lunch? Cool. So welcome back to uh, sort of a part two, not really. But we're going to talk about type erasure. This talk has an outline. Uh, we're going to talk about representation, behavior, and something I like to call affordances. Um, which the term is catching on, I, I like that, and I'm gonna tell you where I got that term. Um, and I'm gonna show you what is type erasure, why is it useful, um, and then I'm gonna build it from the ground up. Uh, we're gonna show some uh, different layout strategies for type erase types, uh, we're gonna do some case studies, I'm gonna show you big screen full of code that I'm probably gonna stumble over, uh, and then we're gonna have some questions. So first of all, if you came to this talk based on only on the title, and you said, oh, type erasure. I know type erasure from C Sharp. I know type erasure from Java. Those languages actually use the words, the exact same words, type erasure, to talk about something completely different and unrelated from what I'm gonna be talking about today. And I could spend a couple slides explaining what they mean by it, but this is a C++ conference, and also I only have an hour, so if you want the gory details on what they mean by type erasure, see my blog post. But I'm not gonna talk about those. In C++, we can motivate this idea of type erasure by asking the question that I asked at the end of my lambdas talk. How do I write functions that accept lambdas as arguments? So the STL way to accept lambdas as arguments is to say, I have a member function uh, for each book, but it's not a function, it's a template. It takes a type parameter, func, and whatever kind of thing you pass to this function for each book, I will stamp out, the compiler will stamp out a copy of this template and specialize it, instantiate it for that specific function type. So if you pass in a lambda of one type, you get an instantiation of for each book for that specific lambda type. You pass in a lambda of a different type, you're gonna get a different instantiation of for each book. This can lead to code bloat. This can lead to lots of very similar copies of the same function. It also means that you have to define this Lambda, or sorry, this uh, template in a header file. Okay? Modules may eventually help with this, but uh, you know, as, as far as C++ as we know it today, templates go in header files, and so that can also increase your compile time, not to mention the compile time of stamping out all those copies. So we're looking for a better way. We're looking for um, a way to have a concrete callback type, concrete CB type here. Uh, this function is not a template. It takes something of a concrete type and I can now move the implementation of for each book into a different CPP file, compile it separately. I get the benefits of separate compilation now. I have just a single implementation, but I can still call it with any kind of lambda. I'm gonna show you how to do that. And that is the magic of type erasure. That is our goal, is to get to this slide. So type erasure essentially is a way of concretifying a template. A template is not a real function, right? It's just a template. It's a textual mechanism for creating functions. Um, but type erasure makes us have a nice concrete function I can compile, I get some machine code for it, and I can put that in an object file. So to contrast these two examples, let's look at C++'s std sort. Std sort in the algorithm header, that's a function template. It's templated on the comparator type. It can take any kind of comparator, and it's a template. That means the compiler has to see it. It's in the header file. That's code bloat, that's slow to compile, although it is very fast. By contrast, the C standard library provided a sorting function called qsort. How many people here have used qsort? Oh, good. Explain it to your neighbor. Um, so qsort is a concrete function. I'm gonna show you its signature on the next slide from the man pages. Uh, qsort can only take one specific function signature, and it's got a lot of void pointers in it. 
Um, now, QSort is defined off in libc.o or libc.so. Uh, it can't be inlined. We're going to pay a performance penalty for it. Uh, but the pro, the upside, is that we don't have to compile it every time we want to use it. Yet another downside is that it's arguably not as type safe as we'd like because of all those void pointers everywhere. We're trying to get the best of both worlds. We're trying to get something that is type safe enough to use in C++ that we feel comfortable using, that we know we're not going to misuse, and yet we want to be able to define them out of line, and we don't want to pay for template bloat. So C has the QSort function, and there's also another function you'll find also in your libc, and that's QSort R. QSort R is identical to QSort, except that the comparison function that you pass in doesn't just take pointers to two elements and then, you know, cast them back to whatever type they're supposed to be and compare them, right? The idea is that with QSort, you write this comparator yourself and you pass in a function pointer and it does casts internally to compare the two things. Uh, now QSort R, uh, the comparison function takes a third argument, which I'm going to be referring to as the cookie parameter takes the, uh, the two elements and also a little cookie that can parameterize the result of the comparison in some way. Uh, for example, maybe uh, we want to sort our array of books by author. Maybe we want to sort our array of books by title. Uh, using the C standard library, I can make calls to QSort R that sort using this biprop comparator, comparison function, uh, that takes pointers to the two elements to compare, and also takes this cookie that tells which property I want to compare on. So, Niklaus Wirth, I think that's how it's pronounced. Americans say worth, they call him by value. It's not my joke. Um, Wirth, uh, in 1976, he wrote a book called Algorithms Plus Data Structures Equals Programs. Uh, so in the same way, I could say that if I have a behavior and a representation, an algorithm and a data structure, behavior and representation equals data type. What is a data type? It's a representation. What do the bits look like? And it's a behavior. What do I do with them? Put those together, we get data type. So if we think about QSort R in this way, I'm not going to think of compare as a function that incidentally takes some extra data, a cookie. I'm going to flip that around. I'm going to think of it as a data representation cookie. And that data representation has associated with it a behavior, which is typified by the compare function. That is the behavior. The function defines the behavior, and then this void star is pointing to some representation. Right? Representation and behavior. If I find a way to package those up together, I have type. Also an influence in the way I think about type erasure is Don Norman, who wrote a book called The Design of Everyday Things. That was uh, in the 1980s. And there was a new version that came out later I haven't read. Um, and he says, affordances refer to the potential actions that are possible on an object. On a He's talking about physical objects. This is not a programming book. This is a user interface and, and real world design book. Um, so we don't, you know, when we're writing a program, we, we would often talk about this function requires this input, right? You have to pass this data to this function so the function can do what it does. But that's not how we think in the real world. In the real world, I don't say, in order to perform opening, I must supply a door, right? We see the door first, and we decide that we are going to open it. The door affords the action of opening. When I see the door, I, I know that it supports the action of opening. So I say it affords. That, uh, that action, that is the affordance of a door, a physical door. So another way to think about QSort R is not to think of that comparison function as an action requiring you to supply a cookie in addition to other things, right? It takes some things and also a cookie. But think about what actions are afforded by the cookie itself, that piece of information, that data. What can you do with a cookie? The only action afforded by cookie is to pass it to the comparison function. Right? It affords only one interesting behavior. So I can take any callable object, going back to template land now, no more C for the rest of this talk. Hold your applause, please. Um, given any callable function object, capital C callable, if I have a reference to a callable that affords calling with no arguments and returning an int, right? I have this object, I don't know anything about it, but I know that that's something I can do with it. It affords that action. 
I can split it up into its representation and its behavior. And here's how I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna say, its representation, the actual bits in memory, well, I can just get a pointer to the, the callable object. Right? Take its address, now I have a pointer to it. And I don't care about its type, I just care about the bits, the representation. So I'm gonna have to make that the void pointer. Right? I no longer care about the type of those bits. Because I'm splitting up my data type into a behavior and a representation. That was the representation part. Now the behavior part, what does it do when I call it? Well, first of all, I need to pass in the representation. So behavior when called takes a representation. And what is it going to do with that representation? It takes in a representation in the form of a, a void star. The, the parameter is named R. It casts it back to the original callable type, whatever that type is. It could be a lambda type, it could be a function type, whatever it is. It dereferences it and it calls it using its operator paren paren, right? Callable here is a static type known to this template foo, right? Whatever, uh, whatever type callable we, was passed in by the user, that's the type we're casting it to here. And now I can plug those two things back together. Behavior plus representation, I pass in the representation to this function that encapsulates everything about the behavior of this callable object. When I call this, I get the same thing as if I had just called the callable directly using its operator print print. I'm gonna pause here and ask if there are questions, just in case. Yeah. Speak up, please. What, oh, plus before lambda, oh, plus before lambda, right. Um, if you were in my lambda talk, uh, uh, I mentioned that if I have a lambda, which is a class type, right, a lambda type is a class type, so this is an instance of a class type, and I'm using unary plus on it. Unary plus is like unary minus. Minus says negate the thing, plus says don't negate the thing. But I need a thing, I need a scalar thing. I need an arithmetic or a pointer type. A lambda's not a pointer type, but it is implicitly convertible to a function pointer. So putting a little plus in front of the lambda actually indicates it's an idiomatic way of saying, please give me a function pointer instead. All right. So we started with an object of type capital C callable. So we can't use that object. We can't call its operator paren paren without knowing that it has an operator paren paren. Right? We have to know something about its static type. We have to know its type. When we split it up into its representation and its behavior, we have erased all the inconsequential aspects of that type. We no longer remember anything about that type size of, it's a line of, whether it's copyable, whether it's trivial, whether it's trivially copyable, right? whether you can negate it or add two of them. All of that information about a type that we have in C++ is all gone. All we remember is its representation and its behavior when called, and those have, are objects of very simple known types. In fact, trivial types, right? One is a void star, the other is a function pointer. Our original objects type callable no longer appears in these declarations. So we're now working our way toward type erasure. But we've got this big mess of C style, you know, void pointers and things. I wanna get rid of that. But before we do, I wanna point out this is not just for calls. Any affordance can be split this way. If I have a negatable object, that is to say an object which affords negation, I can split it up in this way. Suppose I have uh, some negatable number here which affords being bitwise negated and that operation returns an int. Let's just say that it returns an int. I know in real life it might return another negatable, but we're gonna ignore that for the present. We'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Um, we split it up into its representation and its behavior. Its representation is just the bits at that address and the behavior when negated can be represented as a function pointer where I pass in the bits, cast them back to a negatable object of, of that original static type and uh, use bitwise not on it. And then that returns an int. And again, I assert that the behavior when negated of my representation is the same thing I get by using that operator on it directly. All right, so this is not just for calls, although it is certainly most useful for calls. You can also have multiple different affordances Right? Maybe there's a bitwise negated, and there's also Boolean not. Boolean not, let's say, has to return a bool or something convertible to bool. So I can have my representation, and I can have two different behaviors. One of these function pointers encapsulates and erases the idea uh, of negation, bitwise negation. The other one encapsulates the idea of logical not. 
right, by dispatching to the operator not associated with this static type, whatever it is, that's my template parameter. So I have to use the template parameter in constructing this lambda, right, in saying what is the behavior of this lambda. I put this inside my template, let's say. But now I've erased everything about this type. The type only appears in the behavior of the lambda, not in its signature. So I have two different lambdas here controlling two different behaviors. I can have as many affordances as I want on a single representation. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap the representation and its behaviors up into a struct. We're gonna start building some C++ stuff on top of this. I have my raw pointers. I'm gonna wrap them up into a struct type erased number ref. Right? I'm going to put those uh, representation and behaviors uh, as function pointers into the struct. And I'm gonna give it some member functions. I'm gonna give it some overloaded operators. Uh, when you call operator not, uh, operator bitwise not on a type erase number ref, that's just going to call the function pointer, negate a representation, that's gonna return an int, which is gonna get returned back to the user. So now what I have is something that can reference any kind of numeric thing out there, anything that has negate and not. Right? As long as I set the representation and the behaviors, as long as I initialize them to functions with that behavior. How do I do that? Well, I do actually know, I have a recipe for how to make a type erase number ref out of any kind of number. And when we turn that into C++, we should think, well, I'm making an object of this type, that's a constructor, and I'm making it out of anything numeric. So anything at all, any different type, well, it's gonna be parameterized by the type, it's gonna be a template. So I can write a constructor template that looks something like this. So this is a template for stamping out constructors of type erase number ref. They're all implicit constructors because I didn't use the explicit keyword, which maybe I should in this case, I'm not sure. I take a reference to a number. My representation is just the address of that number as, as a void pointer, points to the bits of whatever that is that the user gave me. Uh, and then I uh, initialize my two function pointers, two functions. What are these functions? Um, by the way, I could have put the plus in front of it here. I decided not to, it does implicitly convert as well. Um, so this one function, right? I'm using lambdas here uh, rather than named functions. I could use named functions if I wanted to, but uh, because the behavior of this lambda is pretty much described by what it does, uh, I decided not to, and also it fits on the slide better if I use lambdas. All right, so we can use our constructor template now to wrap any kind of number, uh, any template type at all, uh, into a concrete type erase number ref. Notice that type erase number ref itself is not a template. It's a concrete type that always looks the same. It's, it's representation in memory is always a void star and a couple of function pointers. Those function pointers can point to functions with very different behavior, but they always look the same. We always call them the same way, but they have different behavior. Isn't this interesting? At this point, in fact, I won't even go on. I'll just say at this point, uh, we have something that I would call type erasure. And if you're familiar with uh, the function ref proposal, uh, this is very similar to a function ref. This is just a number ref. I decided to erase operations that were not function calls just to show you that it can be done. But what about ownership? Our type erase number ref, as indicated by the name, it has reference semantics, right? We capture the original object's address and then we reinterpret cast that address. Um, so if the user gave us a reference to a number we made it into a type erase number ref, we passed the type erase number ref around somewhere, we might end up with a dangling reference. That would be bad. So uh, we would like to see how to deal with lifetime and ownership the way the std function does. Right, when I make a std function, I put a lambda in it, I don't have to keep the original lambda alive. I can pass that std function around all over the place. It, you can even copy it, right? How does that work? Well, Destructibility is an affordance. It's a behavior that an object has. Some objects afford destruction, some don't. Admittedly, in C++, you don't usually run into indestructible objects. They're not very useful, but they could exist, theoretically. And so, contrary-wise, destructibility is an affordance. All right, so let's start building a type erase number with value semantics. So not reference semantics, value semantics. So we no longer refer to an int or a double. We now uh, capture an ob actual object of type int, big num, et cetera, inside ourselves. We're gonna manage that object's lifetime, right? In order to manage its lifetime, we are now taking on responsibility for destroying that captured object. So we need to know how to destroy it. Does it even afford destroying at all? 
if it doesn't, then we can't take ownership of it. Um, so the captured object has a representation, just like before, and it has some affordances, just like before, but now destructibility is one of those affordances. I need to know, I need to ask the object, how do you destroy yourself? The captured object can also be large. When we capture an int, maybe we can store that inside ourself, copy it inside ourself. Um, but if it's a big num, some, some other very large type, no matter what size we pick for the memory footprint of our type erased number, uh, the size of that user type might be bigger. So we can't always store it inside ourself. We're going to somehow, uh, we're gonna sometimes at least need to allocate heap memory and store it out there. So I'm just gonna always do that. So we're, we're gonna fall back and punt here. We're gonna use the heap. There are other options for doing small object optimization, but uh, this is already pushing it for a back to basics talk. So we're not gonna talk about small object optimization. We're always gonna allocate our, our captured object out there on the heap. So here's how we might uh, type erase the affordance of destructibility. I have my representation, I have a function pointer that takes the representation in, it doesn't return anything, but its side effect is going to be, here's the initialization for it in my constructor template, the initialization is with a lambda that takes in that representation, casts it back to a number, that's the uh, template parameter to the constructor template, and calls delete on that. Okay, all good. And then of course we call new here, uh, we heap allocate an object of that type. We heap allocate an int or a big num or whatever. And then in my destructor, I have to manually call that type erased delete. I have to say, pass in the representation and please delete it for me. Only this lambda's body, only this implementation understands what it means to delete. So I have to call that function and I have to set it up properly in my constructor template. For copy, there are many, there's like three different ways I can think to do copy. This is just the one I picked for these slides. Um, I make a lambda that takes a representation of a number, uh, casts it back to a number, calls the copy constructor of number, and allocates that object on the heap. So that, I'm calling that clone uh, by analogy with uh, Java. And so this is how I would copy construct a type erased number. I would say it's affordance, how you clone things doesn't change. I'll just copy that function pointer over. That's that last line there. The line above it is initializing my void star, wrapper, and it's initializing it with the result of calling the clone behavior on the number representation of the right-hand side, right? Behavior plus representation, put them together. That uses the type internally to figure out what void star to return to me, and then I can just store that in my wrapper. So our essential strategy here is to list what operations must be afforded by a number in order for type erase number to do its job, and special members also count as affordances. In order to do my job, do I need to copy a number sometimes? If so, that's an affordance, I need to type erase that. I need to remember that in my list of affordances. Uh, for each operation, I write it as a lambda in terms of representation, in terms of that pointer to the representation, and in terms of that type parameter which is a parameter to the constructor template. Remember, my type erased number type itself is not a template, it's a concrete type, it has a fixed layout, but I have a constructor template. So I need to have my, temp my constructor template do all that work of setting things up in terms of the number type. So each lambda's behavior depends on that number type, but its signature is fixed. But if I do everything this way, my footprint is growing, right? For every affordance, I need a new function pointer, you know, at this point, I have clone, delete, and then I have my two original things, which were the whole point of negate and not. Uh, now I've got 40 bytes in my struct. It's now 10 times the size of a four byte int that it's erasing. Uh, how can we shrink its memory footprint? Well, let's go to the diagrams. I love these diagrams. Here's the stack. That's where our function call stacks are. Here's where our local variables are and our parameters. We have the heap over here that we use for new and delete, and we have global data. That's your global variables and your V tables and things like that. So here's the structure that we have right now. I have a representation as a void star and I have a bunch of function pointers explaining the various behaviors, that I, the various affordances that this representation affords me. Um, and right now I'm sticking it all inside my type erase number struct and so it's very big. Those are very big, they're even bigger than the big nums they're storing. But I could do something a little bit different. One thing that's popular is to combine all of our behaviors into a single function and give it one extra argument. 
an enumerator, a discriminator tag, uh, to say which behavior do I want today? And then I would just assign numbers to my different behaviors, you know, to copy press one, to delete press two, you know? Um, so I wrap them all up and, and I can still make a lambda to do that. My lambda would have a switch inside it. I'm gonna show you some code a, a little bit later for that, I believe. In fact, I think it's the next slide. Is it the next slide? It's the next slide. Notice in the upper right hand corner, uh, there is a Godbolt link where you can see this code and you can run it, just to prove that this is not just slide code, but also works. I'm not saying it's the best code ever, but it also doesn't have any typos that I'm aware of. Um, all right, so here's my type erase number. It has only two data members. It has a uh, pointer to void and it has a pointer to a function where that function is going to be something with a big uh, switch inside of it. Uh, over there on the right column, you can see that big function with a switch inside of it. I didn't actually write it as a lambda. I wrote it as a named function. I could have written it as a lambda, but I decided to pull it out, also for purposes of the slide, uh, and make it a function template, which over here I am instantiating with that specific type T, that specific type number that came in as a parameter to my constructor template. So that this would be a reasonable way to do that. And then inside here I say, okay, well if they're asking for behavior zero, that's uh, cloning. If they're asking for behavior one, that's negating. Two is uh, bitwise not, or Boolean nodding. And three is deleting. All right, those are the behaviors that you can get out of this function. And then over here in my overloaded operators, operator minus delegates to uh, the function pointer passing one, operator not delegates passing two, destroying is number three and so on, right? So this is just the machinery for how I would put together um, a complete type erase type that I could then use um, using these techniques we've already seen, right? Split up into behavior and representation. Represent the behavior with a fixed signature as a function pointer. Something else I could do is instead of just having the one behavior, I could leave my behaviors split out, but I could put them into a structure of behaviors, right? Struct uh, TE behaviors here is my structure of function pointers because those are always the same for any given type capital N number, for any type T. So if I have two instances of my type erase number that store the same type internally, uh, they could actually just have pointers into the global data and point to a global table of behaviors for that particular type. Um, so it might look something like this. And I would have a different table. This is the table for big num. I would have a different table for int and so on. Um, so that's something I could do. I could even, if I wanted to make uh, the type erase number representation even smaller, instead of having two pointers here, I could actually take this pointer and move it over into what I heap allocated. And I could do that. I could put a pointer to the table of behaviors at the front of the thing I allocate. Oh, now this is interesting. What does this look like? This looks like a V pointer to a V table, a table of function pointers. So now we can do something type C, right? This is basically a V pointer, this is basically a V table. We can actually implement in C++ type safe type erasure, as long as we're willing to use the heap for everything, which as I said, we are in this course, this class. This whatever this is, session. Um, so I make my struct TE base and I give it a bunch of virtual methods. I give it those same affordances that we had been type erasing. What does it mean to clone this thing? What does it mean to negate this thing, to not this thing? What does it mean to destroy this thing? Um, and then I'm going to make a derived class template not a singular derived class, but a template for stamping out derived classes. Every one of these derived classes is going to derive from TE base. And it's going to override these various affordances. It doesn't need to override destruction because that's uh, gonna get generated for me by the compiler implicitly. That's pretty cool. Um, but it needs to explain, here's how you negate the thing. I'm gonna negate my member. Here's how you not the thing. I'm gonna not my member. Um, and here's how you clone it. I'm going to make another copy of myself. I'm gonna use make unique to do that because as we saw in the shared pointer, uh, smart pointers talk, uh, you know, don't touch raw pointers with your hands. So this code by design doesn't use any raw pointers. Doesn't need to. It can be type safe and leak safe. So over here in my actual type erased number, my struct TE, uh, all I have here is a unique putter to a TE base and I construct it uh, by allocating a derived class stamped out from my derived class template. I've realized I've lost my timer down here, by the way. Um, 
All right, so then we have a copy constructor, and what the copy constructor does is uh, call the clone method, that virtual clone method, that goes down and uses the information that it has erased, and it has the same signature but different behavior. Uh, and again, here I call the negate and the not method. So this would be a way to do completely type safe, completely leak safe type erasure. Of course, this does have that mandatory heap allocation. If you were going to use small object optimization, you were gonna implement small object optimization for your type, you would not do it this way. You would go back to one of those previous slides and start from there instead. So what can we make with type erasure? Uh, in the standard library, we have a std function. Now, std function is a template, but that template parameter has nothing to do with your lambda type. You know, the thing I've been calling capital N number throughout this. Um, that's actually just the signature that the function is callable with. For example, it might say, I take two ints and return a double. Right, that, that's just a very convenient way of specifying that signature that you're erasing. Um, it has no actual relation to a function type at all. Uh, std any uh, wraps anything that affords uh, copying and destroying. That came in in 17. That's interesting. We're gonna talk more about any. Um, function ref and unique function are both being proposed for the next version of C++ after 20. Um, I refer to that as C++ 2B because I really hope it's not 23. I think we need more time. Um, but uh, function ref uh, wraps anything that affords calling. It's very similar to our type erase number ref that we started the lecture with. Uh, unique function uh, is like a function, but it is move only. It doesn't need for that type that is wrapping to afford copyability, to afford copying. It just needs to be destroyable, and it needs to be callable. It doesn't even technically need to be movable. It can, it can actually be immobile for technical reasons. std any is a little funny one though, right? Because I, I said it uh, wraps anything that affords copying and destroying, but no operation. There's no calling or negating. Or any, how do I get a value out of std any? There's nothing I can do with it but make another copy of it, but I've already erased all the type information about it. That's really weird. What do I use that for? Um, well, std any actually does support one more affordance, and that is the go fish affordance. So if I have a std any that has an int inside itself, so here on this first line, I am calling the constructor template of std any instantiated for t equals int, and it's figuring out how to copy an int, how to destroy an int, and it's remembering all that in its table of function pointers inside the std any object. And it's also heap allocating a copy of 42, modulo small object optimization. So now I've got an any that has an int in it, but I don't know that it has an int in it, right? In static type, there's nothing that says int. But what I can do is I can ask it, do you have any ints? And if it does, it will say, yes, and here is the int. I can put a double in it and I can ask it, do you have any doubles? And it says, yes, here's my doubles. Now I can put a double in it and I can ask, do you have any ints? And it will say, go fish. And it will throw std bad any cast rather than give me back a value. So this itself is an affordance. Um, std any can only store objects whose static type is able to tell you whether it is of that type or not. Now in C++, every object knows what type it is, right? So th this is something that is true of all types. They all know what type they are. Of course, that's their type, right? So this is, in a sense, a sort of vacuous or trivial affordance. Every type supports this operation. But it is important because we're going to need to type erase it. We're going to need it to be in our table of affordances that is initialized in the constructor. We need to remember, when someone asks me for an int, if I am an int, I say, here I am. If someone asks me for Something else, I'm gonna say, no, that's not me, go fish. So here's how we might implement that. Here's my std any. Um, so here's my struct any over here. Notice it's not a template. It just has one member, which is a unique pointer to an any base. Here's my any base. Uh, it has the ability to copy itself, and it has this function uh, address that can just return me the actual data. Again, it's just its representation. I don't need any more than that. Uh, my derived class here overrides that to return the address of the T stored inside itself. And then I have this free function anycast. Now this is a template, right? The user's gonna provide what type they think I have, and I'm gonna tell them if they're right or not. 
So one way that I could do this is I could use dynamic cast. I, I have a pointer to an any base. I know I have some kind of any base. I'm gonna try dynamic casting it to an any derived of that type the user gave me. Do I actually have a derived object of type any derived of int? If I do, then it has an int inside itself, so I can ask it for the address of that int, cast it back to an int, and dereference it, and return that int. If it's anything else, the dynamic cast will fail. I'll get null, d will be null, I'll skip over that return, and then I can throw stidbat any cast myself. This is one way you could implement any cast. I am not saying this is how your standard library implements it. Another way you could implement it, this is different, maybe worse, um, is I could give another affordance into my table of affordances here. I could say, I'm going to remember how to get the type info, the type ID, associated with the erased type. And I'm gonna override that in my derived class to return the type ID of this static type T that I was instantiated with. And in my constructor, I'm going to construct an NED of T. And down here in any cast, I'm going to ask that derived object, that heap allocated object, what is your ID? That's going to go over here. It's gonna get me the type ID of, let's say, int. I'm gonna compare that with the type ID of, let's say, whatever the user gave me, let's say double. And, well, if they're the same type ID, then I'm going to return um, the same thing I returned before, get the address of the object, cast it to an int star, return the int. Um, and if not, I'm gonna throw std bad any cast. So this is another way you could implement any cast. I'm not saying this is the way your standard library does it, but it is a way that works. And just for fun, there's a non-standard any cast here. This is something I just sort of thought of a while back. Uh, nobody does it this way because it would not be standard to do this way. But let's suppose that I wanted any cast to be able to ask, do you contain a fruit? And if it contained an apple, it would say yes. And here it is. And here's, a, here's a reference to the fruit part of that apple. Uh, standard any cast doesn't do that. Standard any does not put that particular behavior in its list of affordances that it provides to its users. Um, but you could implement that. You'd have to be a little sneaky with uh, what I'm doing here is I'm uh, throwing a pointer. If I throw a pointer to an apple, I can catch it as a pointer to a fruit. So uh, okay, I'll do that. I'll use throw and catch and use some more of that runtime type information to figure out what I've got. So, just for fun. Uh, what else can we make with type erasure? Um, well, another thing I haven't mentioned yet besides std function, function ref, and unique function, I could also mention that the uh, low latency study group SG14 has in their GitHub repo an in place function. Uh, so the in-place function is parameterized not just by a signature, like all these other function types, but also by a capacity. Uh, you can say, I only want you to store things that fit inside this much capacity, and I want you to store them inside yourself in your memory footprint. Never do a heap allocation, ever. If you try to put something too big into an in-place function, you can get a static assert, right? Because it knows exactly how big an object it can put inside itself. So you might be thinking, okay, so even though he showed us this stuff with uh, minus and not, uh, really, it sounds like variations on std function are really the killer app for uh, type erasure. And there is a reason for that. Uh, when we use type erasure, we are erasing everything about its type except for its certain behaviors, right? Inside, we remember two things, the representation and the behavior. But our user, the user of std function, doesn't even care about the type's representation. They just care about its behavior. So each behavior has a fixed signature. Well, a behavior with a signature, that's practically the definition of std function, right? It, it type erases some sort of behavior with a fixed signature. So it's no surprise that variations on that um, are the most common use for type erasure. This would also be a good time to mention that std function has a lot of problems, problems that now can't be fixed because of ABI compatibility concerns. Uh, you know, it relies on runtime type information, it has issues with const correctness, uh, it's big and slow and does heap allocation. Um, and so part of why I enjoy talking about this kind of stuff is that I think a lot of people will find that at every employer you go to, you will implement unique function or you will implement unique re or, uh, function ref, you know, in your code base. If your code base doesn't have one of these, 
um, if you're passing around const std function ref to a lot of places, um, you might consider going home and implementing some type erasure. Right? That's not gonna change. Even if we get unique function, function ref, in place function into the standard, or we get some generic uh, kind of type erasure mechanism uh, as a library feature, um, I think people are still gonna end up implementing this themselves. Another thing we can make with type erasure is uh, if you went to my smart pointer talk, you saw that the deleter associated with a controlled object of a shared putter is actually stored on the heap in that control block so that I can have two different shared putter of ints. I can have uh, SI and SJ. Here I'm using the aliasing constructor to construct SI and SJ. I'm just making an int on the heap. Um, SI is deleter. When I let SI you know, go out of scope with that curly brace, it's actually going to destroy the widget that is controlled by the control block. SJ, when it goes out of scope, it's going to destroy an int. Yet SI and SJ have the same static type. They're both shared putter of int. So in a sense, I have done type erasure here. I have two things of the same concrete type. They have the same static type. Their type is indistinguishable, but their behaviors are different. Um, and again, there's a reason for that, and that is that a deleter is just something where you pass it a pointer and it does some side effect and it returns void. Right? Anything that fits that signature, I can use that as a deleter for a shared putter. So that's awfully close again, this did function. Right? It's a single sort of unary behavior with a fixed signature. What about non-unary behaviors? So our type race number, I specifically picked all these unary operators to show off. Right? Operator paren paren is a unary postfix operator. Minus and tilde and not, those are unary prefix operators. What about division? If I have a type erase number one storing an int and a type erase number two storing a double, can I somehow overload the division operator for those, uh, for type erase number so that I can get a type erase number out that can give me, you know, one half, like one divided by 2.0? Can we do that? Uh, sadly, no, not easily, probably not even difficultly. Um, this is the problem known as multiple dispatch, uh, or open multi-methods. Right? The idea that we would have to ask both the left-hand side and the right-hand side if they had an opinion on how division should be done. Right? C++ gets around this statically with rules such as integer promotion, uh, arithmetic promotions, where uh, it will promote the one to a double, but it only knows that because the other side is a double, right? There's a big table of all the possible permutations of things. If I try to throw a big num in here, I'd have issues. Essentially, this is very sad, but multiple dispatch is a very hard problem, not a problem that has a solution at the moment in C++. Uh, for more on multiple dispatch, I highly recommend uh, Eli Bendersky has a series of blogs on multiple dispatch and on uh, what's known as the expression problem, so I recommend reading those. Um, but if you're gonna ask me for advice on how to do this, I'm gonna tell you, can't be done in the general case. Um, in conclusion, uh, things to take away from this talk, now that you've seen you know, slides and slides full of code, and you're like, what, what, what am I here for? Um, the things I think you should take out of this room are, number one, what is type erasure? Uh, std function and std any use type erasure, right? That, if someone says, what's type erasure? You say, oh, it's like std function. That's a good answer. That's a good back to basics result. It's like std function. Or std any, then you can show that you know 17, so that's an even better answer. Um, type erasure, what does it let us do? It lets us pass arbitrary types, arbitrary lambdas, across ABI boundaries. It gives us the flexibility of templates with the speed and um, separate, speed of separate compilation, right? I can compile my actual algorithm just once. I don't have to recompile that same algorithm over and over for every different template parameter type. Um, the other thing I want you to take away from this, even if you didn't get all that code, you know, even if you, I saw people taking pictures, good, good for you. It's not gonna come out, wait for the video. Um, I want you to take away the type erasure is not too hard to write by yourself. There are many different ways that you can do it. I showed a whole bunch. I showed three different ways to write any cast. Um, but they all follow the same pattern, and that is list your affordances. What does this type uh, afford? What does it need to afford for me to be able to use it in my type erased number or whatever I'm writing? 
Lister affordances, that includes special members, copyability, destructibility. Make your vtable, make it manually with a bunch of function pointers. You do that uh, type safe method, whatever you wanna do. Um, initialize each behavior in a constructor template using a bunch of lambdas, uh, using named functions if you want, using a single named function with a big switch, but initialize those behaviors. Um, and remember that copyability and destructibility are affordances just like any other uh, operation on a type. Right? And that means uh, you may not need them at all, and if you do need them, you're gonna have to type erase them. They're gonna go in your list of affordances. And with that, we have about 13 minutes for questions because I thought there might be some. So uh, there are mics uh, here and here, and otherwise, thank you for coming. You mentioned that the one function approach is pretty popular these days, and then you moved on to talk about other approaches. I'm just curious what you think the pros and cons are of that approach. Does it have merit? Is it something we should take a closer look at? Um, well, one reason I moved on is that I wanted to talk about the type safe type erasure, which is the most naive version. When, I, when I've taught type erasure, for example, if you took my weekend class, I start with this, and I go the other direction. I show the optimizations. Um, here I started with QSORT R and I built up in that direction. Um, so let's see, what was our problem with this? Well, one problem with this is that if you look at the code that it generates, we have the uh, function that has the big table of behaviors and it has a switch every time. Um, so just like, just like the phone system analogy, right? You, you, go, you go call the phone and you have to sit through, oh, press one for this and two for this and you know, you're like, oh, come on, get to the one I want, right? Same thing happens here, right? It might be a little bit slower than if I just had a function pointer that I could just call and it would just do the thing I want, right? I have to do a switch. That's a little bit of extra indirection. Uh, I get the same indirection if I go to the vtable approach, because then I have to go, uh, you know, in this case, follow the pointer, follow the pointer, index at the table. Finally, I have a function pointer I can use. So if we can reduce indirection, that can help. For things like uh, function ref, where it only has a single behavior, and I can just put that function pointer right there in the class, that can be extremely fast. I don't have to do any of this. There's no trade-off for function ref. It just has one behavior. But for this where I had a whole table of behaviors, I have to figure out how to do that lookup in a way that might be fast. Of course, it's all, you know, it's all fast, right? There is no zero cost abstraction, um, but all of these are relatively small based on the benefit that they give you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the talk. A quick question about slide 30. Slide 30, yeah. So negate returns integer. Yes. Should it be returning a number? Um, negate cannot return capital N number because up here I do not know what type capital N number is. I, I can't put it in the signature. I also, I can't even put it down here because again down here I don't know what capital N, well down here I do know what capital N number is but it might not be covariant, you know, it might not match what the base class has. Um, that relates to multiple dispatch, right? Um, one thing I could do here, I could take the Stedeni approach. I could say negate actually uh, here, so operator minus on a TE. I said it returns an int, which is nice because then the user can go use that int, they can printf it, whatever. I could say operator minus returns a TE, but then how do you get the result out of the TE, right? You, you need at some point to be able to get it out. And you can do that either by providing methods like I have here, where they return a concrete type, uh, or by using the gofish method of any cast, saying, I hope you have an int for me now, and then going and getting it. But if it really had a double, you wouldn't be able to get it out, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. We still got 10 minutes. All right, thank you for coming.